Well, uh, welcome back, everybody, um, and welcome to um, the afternoon session of Exactitude. Um, uh, let's start off with uh, Sunil Bald, um, uh, who is associate professor, uh, uh, I'm sorry, associate dean, uh, and William Henry Bishop, a visiting professor uh, of architecture at uh, the Yale School of Architecture. Uh, and Sunil is also a partner of the architecture and design firm uh, SUMO, S-U-M-O, uh, which was awarded uh, the annual prize in architecture from the American Academy of Arts uh, and Letters. And SUMO's work uh, ranges from institutional buildings uh, to installations uh, that have appeared at the National Building Museum uh, in Washington, uh, MoMA, and the, Vien uh, and the Venice Biennale. Uh, Sunil has also received fellowships uh, from the Fulbright and Graham Foundations. Uh, so uh, he will uh, begin uh, the afternoon uh, with a talk, Building in the Floating World. Sunil Bald, it's a pleasure. Great, uh, thank you, Michael. Um, so just, yeah, thank you for uh, including me in this incredible group of speakers and this incredible conversation. Um, I am going to um, share my screen. So um, today I would like to um, talk about exactitude through floating, um, not in opposition to it, though the shape of the words couldn't be more different. Exactitude has a menacing staccato sharpness, a quality Mark articulated so beautifully in the delivery of his talk yesterday. It feels like a dangerous word, one that could puncture, puncture the gentle roundness of floating, and bring it down to earth at any instant. My preconception of exactitude before thinking through this talk was through its linearity, a prefigured intention awaiting accurate and measurable realization. Floating, on the other hand, adapts its course in response to forces and winds from multiple directions. In the essay Exactitude, Italo Calvino argues for precision in writing from outline or prefiguration to image to detail. This precision relies on shared evocation through the consensus of shared language. In building, one might translate this into a shared datum a shared ground as the literal tableau from which and on which to measure, to outline. This can extend to a shared sense of groundedness where architecture strives to conjure a sense of being and belonging, even if access to architecture has historically been limited by mechanisms of power. To be denied access, to be outside, to be ungrounded is to float. While this may create a sense of crisis in the modern Western psyche, floating inspires more complex states of being going back to Taoism, where according to the art historian David Waterhouse, the term floating world that I'll explore today can originally be traced. The concept of floating world in Buddhist texts from the 10th century Japan could also mean sad troublesome world or going with the flow. The lotus, reflecting the floating Buddha, has roots in an earth that is liquid, muddy, and is done, has none of the stability of a datum from where one would begin to lay out the critical dimensions for a building foundation. Rather, Calvino's evocation of clarity is more embodied, not by the lotus roots, but by the lotus flower delineated against the sky a kind of floating where purpose is not defined by ground, but is formed in response to currents. This image of the floating flower by the 17th century Japanese artist Ogata Korin leads me to speak, leads me to speak briefly about Yukioi. Commonly translated as pictures of the floating world. Typically Japanese woodblock prints are all grouped together as Yukioi. However, the word originally referred to something very specific that developed around the growth of Edo, the city that became Tokyo, where power was consolidated after the fall of the regional shogunate and the seeds of the Japanese nation were planted. As the scholar Taiman Screech has noted, calligraphy and woodcut prints in early Edo were typically meant to document and idealize everyday life in a growing metropolis for a protected elite 
whose movement was restricted. Calligraphy might recount the time the rooster crowed in the morning or how many bags of rice were delivered, while images like this one showing a new bridge over the Sumida River celebrated the technical prowess and new infrastructure of the new city. In short, these images crafted a master narrative of an idealized city for a fixed audience, protected from the complexities of burgeoning urbanity by their social stature. Fixity became paradigmatic to Central Edo, regulated by social hierarchy and reinforced in images. With the growth of urban culture and a new type of non-agrarian work, however, came a new type of leisure, that of commodified entertainment. The shogunate sanctioned such spaces, but removed them from the fixed world, in this case, central Edo, creating the Yoshiwara district north of the center up the Sumida River from the temple district of Asakusa, then the northern edge of Edo. Removed, the area became rich with burgeoning theater, geisha houses, and brothels. To regulate the fun, getting out of hand, on entering the district, men checked their swords, which denoted their social rank. Removed from the fixed world and one's place in it, Yoshiwara became known as the floating world, Yukio, and Yukioi, the pictures that idealized its actors, courtesans, and spaces and idealized, idealized they were, obscuring the violence and sexual slavery within. This is a well-known portrait of the actor Otani Oniji by Shiraku, one of the most renowned Yukioi artists, himself a floating being, who appeared out of nowhere in March 1794 and disappeared 10 months later, his whole artistic production, 142 images coming in that span. I recount this overwrought preamble or ramble to pose floating against fixity, groundedness, rather than against exactitude. Indeed, even the floating world had its own protocols of precision. This Yukioi by Hishikawa Moronobu, entitled Tsubone Agaru no Tomo, depicts a low-end brothel in Yoshiwara, the display room on the left and the private room behind the orange curtain on the right. Within the word that describes brothel, tsubone is tsubo, which to this day remains the unit of measure for floor area in Japan, equal to two tatami mats, or 3.3 square meters, quantifying the space and consequently the experience of encounter with exactitude. The floating practice. So here I'd like to veer sharply to practice and explore the fluid relationship of measures and numbers to circumstances, sometimes ephemeral or even accidental. While the space between architectural intention is drawn and architectural object as built might be measurable, even quantifiable by objective or even subjective criteria, architectural practice floats between multiple forces, ambitions, preconceptions, expectations. However, these can have their own form of exactitude, sometimes an arbitrary exactitude and guided by a collection of measures. With this in mind, I would like to move through a couple of projects, modest in scope, but demanding in navigating the values and numbers that influenced their flow towards realization. So working on a series of projects in Japan from 2003 to 2018, Studio Sumo epitomized practice as an exercise in floating. Having been recently formed at the beginning of this period by a black woman and a first generation Asian American, Sumo had little access to the fixed world of architectural opportunity in the US and thus followed teaching opportunity overseas, building a relationship with Josai University for whom we designed over a dozen projects, five of which were built, including the two I'll discuss today. Josai University was founded in 1965 by Mikio Mizuta, an economist and Japan's finance minister for much of its post-war growth. He is best known for shepherding the modern yen as a force in world currency in the mid 60s. First, by precisely tying it to the dollar at 360 yen, a number that symbolically referenced the cyclical regenerative ethos of Shintoism in order to gain the confidence of the Japanese people. Then, 
in the early 70s, he allowed the yen to float. He soon died, he died soon after, and his daughter Noriko Mizuta became chancellor until stepping down in 2018. Our design and construction partners during this stretch were the Obayashi Corporation, founded in 1892 by Yoshigoro Obayashi, a kimono merchant from Osaka who repaired temples as a side business. Obayashi is now one of the so-called big five construction companies in Japan, along with Takanaka, Taisei, Kajima, and Shimizu, all of which operate like giant design build offices. Some of their projects, you can see clockwise from upper left is uh, Niken Seke, again, Niken Seke with the, um, the uh, Sky Tree, uh, Jean Nouvel, and Kengo Kuma. We were lucky to work with the same group over this span. You can see the construction team in the upper row and the design team in the bottom row, anchored by Koji Onishi in the center, who went from junior job captain in this photo on our first project to director of design on the right in this photo uh, 15 years later all the while remaining the lead singer of a band that exclusively did Van Halen covers. But that's a subject of another lecture and perhaps even another symposium. Well, whether we were working with our partners from overseas or in person, designing within a building culture with its own specific protocols and language is a challenge to a linear process of simply materializing intention. Indeed, exacerbated by working with associates that were arms of a construction company, exactitude took the form of allowances, goals, standards to meet. It was therefore crucial to frame exactitude not as an extension of immovable fixity, but as a form of continual becoming through adaptive processes uh, from the glitches of cross-cultural collaboration. The floating object. In addition to his work as a politician, economist and educator, Mikio Mizuta amassed an impressive collection of art, particularly a trove of Yukioi prints anchored by nine of Shiraku's 142 works, including one of the three existing prints of, of this image on the left. We were asked to create a small museum at Josai University in Saitama Prefecture, an hour north of Tokyo. Um, it, this is an aerial of the campus um, uh, that, would that would display the collection on a rotating basis. However, as a university museum it, um, adjacent to the university entry, which is at the upper right hand corner of this aerial shot and highlighted here in blue, it also served a more, the building also served a more prosaic role. Uh, to provide information and document the life at the school, in addition to a gallery for rotating exhibitions of contemporary crafts, usually coming from the adjacent community. Three boxes, two ramps, 17 cherry trees. The site itself was shaped by both the grid of the campus and the diagonal geometry oriented towards Josai Hill to the west or the left of this slide. A, com um, a compressed site ringed by 17 cherry trees, none of which could be removed. Their required 8,000 square feet necessitated two floors, while the budget and tight space requirements did not support a freight elevator or a substantial back of house. We conceived of a building that was therefore grounded in the fixed world of the everyday while floating above it. Three galleries, uh, one glass box two meters um, below ground level, one black box encasing the art of the floating world one meter above ground level, and one white box for changing exhibitions two meters above ground level. Thus allowing for a four meter floor to floor from the glass box to the white box. All galleries served by perimeter ramps that acted as both loading and visitor entry. One meter is the maximum rise and 12 meters a maximum run for a, a ramp in Japan. Two runs up, two runs down and landings. The measure determined the length of the building, the two meter distance 
from the core of each cherry tree determine the width. Achieving floating required a process of designing towards numbers that were both prosaic and prescribed. You can see in the lower right hand section, nine is the um, transparent box, five is the black box, six is the white box. 120 millimeters, 311. The outer edges of the ramp were lined by precast panels, giving definition to the volume, but having no load bearing properties. Rather, the galleries hunker down to the site encased in a cast in place structure. The white box gallery, though, cantilevers over the excavated space of the glass box, manifests the, the psychic space of floating above the fixed and prosaic contained in the glass box. Well into the construction drawings, however, Obayashi, guided by risk management more than structural exactitude, recommended thin 120 millimeter diameter columns, mostly to prevent sag and consequent cracking in the concrete. They recounted another museum project they built by Tomohiko Yamanashi, the design director of Niken Seke, Japan's largest design firm, that also cantilevered and had experienced such a problem. This one was quite a cantilever. Um, so on March 11th, I traveled to the countryside where the museum was located to look, entered and ventured to the cantilever where I first felt a gentle sway and then a violent shaking. Three days later, making my way back to Tokyo following the great Kanto earthquake, I no longer had ground to stand on, so to speak, to argue the column proposal. Unfortunately, the recommended diameter had grown to 140 millimeters. These photos were taken to assuage concern about their girth. The model shown here did not even work for Obayashi, but was a friend of a team member brought in for his short round stature that served both as scale reference and distraction, making the columns seem thinner and eschewing the exactitude of stru structural calculation to extend instead make a visual case for the negligibility of 20 millimeters. And painted with automotive paint, the columns would almost certainly disappear. Fifty-two panels, 104 days. As mentioned, the perimeter ramps of the museum were lined by a concrete screen and formed a kind of engawa for the galleries, the strip of space between exterior, interior, and interior common in traditional Japanese architecture. These were both for entry and service and operated as an attenuated threshold between the campus and the galleries, more evocative of the trip along the Sumida River from Edo to Yoshiwara. The, process, the procession was shielded by a second skin providing shade but not enclosure with slit-like openings continuing from vertical to horizontal. Rather than risk cracking from a cast-in-place process, the walls were conceived of as 52 unique L-shaped panels, the largest almost 10 meters high, each with an opening at the edge and then seamed together. The panels have two smooth sides with the short end of the L um, also skewed to the slope of the ramp, necessitating they be cast on edge. A single mold was made with one panel cast every two days using foam blocks to alter height and opening location, then left to cure until transported to be clipped together in a two-day period. The entry facade is framed by two portals ramping down to the left and up to the right. A Buddha sculpted by a disgraced former prime minister who took up ceramics in his post-political life hovers above in this glass box. Downward, one arrives at a sunken court. The floating object over the transparent gallery. One enters the museum on axis with the Buddha, the black box to the left and the entry to the, of the, to the white box to the right. 
And finally, down below, the transparent box that encases the disappearing columns, although here not so disappearing, that float the volume above. The floating subject. From even before the 17th century, when burgeoning Edo challenged the fixity of the social order, the floating subject has continued to be a fixture, first in Japanese lore and then in its national narrative of modernization. Indeed, in Kisho Kurakawa's capsule de declaration, he used the example of the kago, used to transport nobility as a cultural precedent for his work. The post-war internationalization of Japan's population, US military occupation, and multinational corporations, and most recently working class immigrants, has created multiple groups of floating subjects. 44 rooms, 24 countries, one facade. Among the most recent group of floating subjects is the international student. With Japan's declining birth rate, private universities are in dire need of students for financial survival. The international student represents an increasingly important pipeline. Decades ago, Josai University's second campus, Josai International University, and not far from Narita Airport, wisely made alliances with countries of Southeast Asia and the, for and the former Soviet Republic. The university dormitory, however, is relatively rare as a type in Japan, since most national students typically would stick close to home or rent private apartments. Given that many of the landlords in this small town were wary of foreign students, the university asked us to design a dormitory or eye house. If you'll indulge me in a brief description of the building, it sits on the far north edge of the campus uh, on, the ca on this campus plan, north is to the right, the site's south edge across the street from the main campus entrance, which is right here. The north edge is bounded by rice fields. The site itself is next to a soccer field and has a retention pond that doubles as a strange outdoor amphitheater, which you can see here. To minimize the footprint, the building is a narrow bar at the north edge. A chunk is taken out to provide an entry court and frame a view to the rice fields. This court is anchored by a foot of public programs, including a small soccer museum, again the subject for another lecture. The dorm rooms line the northern edge facing the fields and serve by exterior walkways on the south edge that hang a facade of interlaced off the shelf aluminum louvers of varied widths. The walkways themselves widen areas for students to hang out in. The facade itself blurs into a single surface that responds to the light over the course of the day from morning to afternoon. The grain of the facade parallels approach to the void in the bar from which one enters the building. $70, 10 centimeters, eight months. These are three important metrics with literal tolerance that guided the design and production of this building. $70 refers to the monthly rent set to accommodate the majority of the students who came without much in the way of financial resources. Therefore, living space had to be minimal and each student was given a storage container in this adjacent structure to the right of the building. The majority of the rooms housed four students with loft beds and desks underneath. The space was designed with little tolerance for messiness, but the critical condition that arose was the genkan the indispensable sunken space in Japan where shoes must be exchanged for slippers, here highlighted in pink. Floors are typically built up at least 10 centimeters from the subfloor to make the genkan. To make this project economically viable for the university, it required five floors to fit underneath the zoning height limit, which required a three, mil three meter floor to four heights. 
a mechanical soffit dropped the ceiling further at the entry in order to meet the 2.2 meter head height requirement, while then also accommodating the 10 centimeter floor rise for the Genkan, requiring an unorthodox structural solution, which was to eliminate beams. Uh, my apologies for the legibility of these plans, but walls, the walls contain these, the thickened walls here and here contain cast in place 40 centimeter by 120 centimeter column walls that are wide enough to provide lateral support. In addition, the floor slab sandwiched three layers, a layer of prefabricated concrete panels, a layer of foam, and then finally a layer of cast in place concrete, lightening the slab and eliminating the need for the beam, allowing for the genkan, and accelerating the curing time, which allowed the building to be completed in eight months, aligning with the academic calendar of the university. The resulting dorm rooms are pretty tight, more like a collection of berths, though each has four individual mini fridges, so spaces of circulation like corridors with sliding glass doors that extend space onto the walkways, the walkways themselves and various outdoor courts become areas in which to gather, in which to breathe, and in which to float. Thank you so much, Sunil. I believe Michael will come on and ask you the first question, uh, and then I will continue. Yes. Um, <clears throat> I just wanted to ask um, Sunil, uh, this morning, um, Antoine Picon talked about uh, architecture as a conversation. And um, can you talk about the kind of conversations uh, you had, you know, pick one of your projects uh, between, um, let's say, the, the client and the, and the design team and uh, the construction team uh, that, uh, fed the process of, of design and realization? Uh, sure, yeah. Um, I, the, the, um, the interesting thing I think about these projects and our relationships was with both the client and the construction company were that they were very long term. And so in some respects, there. The, it was very much a three-way conversation with us in the middle, and which was quite unusual since we were the only actors that didn't speak an actual language uh, or like literal language of Japanese. And typically a meeting might begin in English and then end in Japanese with um, blank looks on my face at least. Um, but the conversations were actually then did end up being about intention I think on one hand, coming from the client, um, and then conversations about um, what I mentioned before, allowances coming on from the, uh, from the construction company. And those were portrayed very much, again, not through literal language of Japanese or English, but through um, the, um, I say like, the, this particular chancellor of the university was also a, a Yale-educated um, feminist historian. And so she had certain ambitions about creating Japanese campuses, which began to also approximate uh, cultural life of American campuses. And so there was that kind of cultural conversation that we were very much a part of and understood on one hand, and then having to relay that to an arm of a large construction company that had really created very technocratic ideas of what university campuses were, on the other hand, were, um, were very interesting to have them though being a mediator of those types of conversations while at the same time not having access to the actual language and subtleties that might be portrayed you know, within being able to speak Japanese. Oh, thank you. So I have a question for you, Sunil, and that is that 
curiously enough, talking about a floating word, your practice also has benefited from this continuity in the context and in the collaborators, which is, which is also a very special kind of luxury. And so my question is, how do you think your practice will change or react when you're removed from this very, at this point, very well-known context for you and then be operating in a different world? How, how does that affect the way you're doing things or does it? Um, yeah, I, I think it has <laughs> actually, because this work has ended now um, after 15 years. Um, and in some ways, as you say, uh, Perry, it was, has been very much a luxury. And, um, and even, even occupying that space of floating, I think, has been uh, on a, both a very personal level, but even as a method of practice, I think, um, very fruitful. And so, admittedly, it's a kind of moment of crisis, I would say. <laughs> Especially, you know, uh, working on projects like for the New York City, Dis you know, Department of Design and Construction, for instance, it's it's a very much a rude awakening. Um, so, I'm I'm there. There is a moment right now, at least for me, of actually thinking about how to build a practice again in mm -hmm. a country that is the country that I, you know I live in. Well, uh, I'm, I'm sure that something very interesting will come out of the moment of crisis since you've been so successful in being able to bridge so many gaps. I will can pass I, can I jump in? Yeah. Uh, it, it's interesting that Pari asked this question because I wanted to ask very much from the same standpoint in the sense that also as a practitioner and as someone that uh, has worked for a split second in Japan, um, it's interesting in the context of this symposium on exactitude to see your amazing work. It was beautiful to see and beautifully presented. Um, how, how connected it is because somehow the Japanese mind is also very connected to exactitude. So you brought the idea of floating, but really just the idea of exactitude, I think is profoundly embedded in Japanese culture. So, so definitely you uh, had the privilege of that. At the same time, there is the interesting thing that um, in the gallery project in particular, um, the site constraints, the trees and the lifting and the ramps uh, spoke so much to me uh, in a way that is also very close to the way we operate uh, on the idea of how this kind of pushback can be incredibly productive. So if you just wanted to elaborate a little bit more on that. You know, I agree. I think that, um one lesson learned uh, from Japan has been exactly um, like working within constraints and the constraints that are often about um, uh, feeling out of place and then sort of not having the, not feeling the legitimacy to kind of push back against constraints. And then over time, one begins to learn like the, um, the exactitude or the precision of the culture is as much about, uh, not, is, is not, is as much about uh, protocols as is about say, preconce preconceived constrictions of what one can and cannot do. So I think what we found were that, yes, yeah, something like a cherry tree is something that is an immovable object. Um, but, uh, but say during a design process that almost up to, um, the schematic design or anything is possible. Um, and, but after a certain point, protocols become very strict and things have to adhere to a certain exactitude of procedures and of, um, relationships and um, and and measure too, and I think that the working with a company like Obayashi, I think, is especially interesting because that space between what's drawn and what is built is collapsed within one entity or agency. So that's where one does not 
use measure as a way to um, to assess that space between intention and result instead often measure comes first as like I said a kind of allowance that one designs towards I wonder if I could ask um, sort of uh, w connecting back to uh, Chris Bemphy's talk um, yesterday um, about uh, the role of Wabi um, in any kind of thoughts um, you, know, you design with uh, according to certain processes and then as you were saying uh, with protocols in place um, and the building is complete uh, and then what? Um, you know, it, it's, uh, they're out, it, floating out in the weather. Um, and uh, does that factor at all into your um, thinking process or vision of the life of the building? Um, um, yeah, I mean, I think with the, um, at least with that museum project, it very much did because of the nature of the site, the overgrowth of the green. And there was from the beginning an idea that it would even the, um, the dripping of, and continually going back to see it, um, the, the slits in the concrete are actually really great for creating dirty drips along the concrete. Um, so what that, so there's a way that it's actually just sort of left to age now. And that outer surface that is almost allowed to age then kind of protects an inner surface which remains pristine. Also, I think one thing about these, um, you know, the first project that we finished in Japan was a, business, a 70,000 square foot business school that is now um, uh, 14 years old. Um, in six years, it's a 70,000 square foot building. It's made of cast concrete. In, 70, 000, in uh, six years, it will actually have no value. And because of the depreciation of buildings in Japan, so land and architecture are valued separately from each other. So land rises in value and, and buildings depreciate. And after 20 years, a building basically has no value, even as um, assessments are done uh, for campus assessments um, in terms of the assets of the campus, an older building can basically then have no value. So it's, it's very interesting, I think, that in, I was thinking about this in Chris's talk, just that um, the aspect of weathering in Japan, it does end up do, having patinas, you know, or these, there's this kind of beautiful material effect. But then there's also, I think, I wonder if, if there was a way that's like the, you know, just kind of like the financial systems, the way things are valued, then also allows for that you know, things aren't precious because actually mm. may not have any value. Uh-huh. Oh, that's very, uh-huh. So rather, rather than aging, increasing value and, you know, each uh, tendril of ivy, you know, being <laughs> a treasure, uh, that's very interesting. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if I could ask a, a question, Sunil. Uh, you showed um, a print of a bridge Mm -hmm. And um, it made me wonder if you, the designs that you made um, were inspired by the figure, by the motif of the bridge. Is that something you were consciously drawing from? It was, I think, for the, um, you know, both of those projects, they have these series of thresholds. And part of it, part of those thresholds were, uh, or, or, you know, I, re I referenced the Ngawa, which as many of you know, is the perimeter um, threshold that exists around Japanese homes, but is usually accessed in perpendicular to it, so you cross it. Um, whereas I think with both these projects, there's a, there's a linearity to engaging that space. And both of them were there too for cost reasons of not enclosing these spaces, mm -hmm. especially with the dormitory where rooms could be just accessed in, from an unconditioned space. So this, the, um, that river and ideas of that kind of voyage, um, which um, especially researching um, Yukiwi during that, um, the design of that project, we began to think very much of using that necessity for that unconditioned space 
as an attenuated procession, not unlike, not less about the bridge, but actually more about the river. And so mm -hmm. that kind of flow from one space into the other. Thank you. Wonderful. There are a couple of questions from the audience. I'll read the first one and then I'll let Michael read the second one. So Isabel Santos is asking, if land becomes to have value over building, what happens to the displacement of people for that value? And although I understand the perimeters, these are important. Sorry, this is um, missing something from the question. I don't know. I'm not really sure. I'm hoping that the person who asked us maybe types the remainder of the question, I guess. Um, I can pass on to the second one because I'm not really sure the question is clearly formed. Ludmila is asking, did you discuss any performance measures to guide the construction of your projects from an energy efficiency perspective? Uh, much more so, yes, with the with the dormitory um, specifically, yes. I mean, it, there was by um, uh, by keeping the profile of the building narrow, a single loaded corridor. I mean, it, it allowed us having that single loaded corridor. We were able to do it in order to leave more space on the site for future development for the university. But it also allowed for every room to be cross ventilated. Um, and every room, so much more kind of like passive, um, uh, passive performance strategies, especially because these are such low um, budget buildings. Even the museum is quite low budget as well. The screen, um, in addition to providing an edge to the ramp, also provided a kind of shading device for the um, exterior walls of the galleries. And so it lowered the, museums are the least sustainable buildings, I think, around just because of the mechanical loads that are required, especially for things like UKOE or preserving those types of, um, preserving those environments. So that concrete screen, even though it's quite robust, did create um, a sort of, and the, the, the ramp space created a, a thermal buffer also for the exterior walls of the gallery. So we were able to reduce the load, uh, the mechanical load for those galleries. But Okay. Um, and, yes, and we have a, uh, another question. Um, uh, one of the audience members asks, uh, in addition to notions of quantitative precision, Calvino also talked about exactitude of expression. In your experience, do you think that the presence of the floating subject and the absence of common spoken language in the traveler, the international student, or even the American architect demands a greater exactitude of intention and expression? Oh, wow. That's interesting. <laughs> <laughs> I think, I mean, actually one thing that uh, as putting this talk together that I thought was really interesting was um, just the exactitude of misunderstanding if there is such a thing and, or the, and, or perhaps, because I, what we felt both in our process, but also I think within the dormitory itself and the notions of, um, of basically putting to people together who don't speak a common language, just the productivity that can happen from those types of instances. And we found that in our miscommunications as the kind of um, traveling architect, the miscommunications with the um, construction company people often led to third solutions, which were much better than the the two that each of us were proposing towards each other. So um, I don't know if that completely answers the question because it was a really long and nuanced one. Um, but just in terms of that experience, I think that um, we found that misunderstanding was actually really very productive territory um, 
in the, these processes. I'm going to take one last stab and try to formulate Isabel's question or observation, perhaps. Um, I think there is the comment that Isabel is making is about how if land becomes the permanent thing, the one that has value over buildings, then architecture becomes temporary in a way. And so in a way, it's completely kind of reversed this, this connection between architecture as um, the provider of some sort of a permanence is completely reversed. And I'm not really sure if this is a question or a comment, but I think that's what I'm understanding from Isabel's. Yeah, it's, <laughs> <You agree. laughs> it's uh, very true. And um, there's, you know, it, it's um, usually noted that that's kind of rooted back you know, people will take it back to the Issei Shrine um, as a building that is constantly renewed every 20 years, or even aspects of authenticity in, in historic Japanese architecture that's typically made of wood. Basically, every piece has been replaced over the years. So is it still the original building? Um, so I think there are those levels of, of, um, of impermanence that are are just kind of culturally embedded, but then I think economically embedded. That's why these five construction companies are some of the biggest companies in Japan. There's always things to build. And it's only recently in Japan that um, like I, uh, people like say, well, um, Atelier Bow Wow, for instance, is doing a, a lot of now um, renovation work. And you know, this is kind of a new thing in Japan of reusing buildings. Um, and, but before is a very kind of unsustainable system or just kind of wasteful system to build or to rebuild. 